And the next image shows a close-up of that same region. And this is magnetic field, and you can see the little wiggles going out from the sunspot, waves going out the, the, the magnetic loops there. You can also see, it's a little hard in the, in the movies, but to, to watch it, you can see the, the network, that clustering of fields is slowly changing um, as, as it's evolving, as the flows are moving it around. But as interesting as the magnetic field is, in fact, we'll take those magnetic field data and combine them with AIA data and to try to model what's happening in the corona because that's where the fields control what's happening. In addition to the line of sight field that we were looking at, HMI will measure the vector field, the horizontal component. That was just the component in the direction of the observer. But we'll also see the field that's perpendicular to that. Um, that, that data we, we won't show today, um, but probably next week. Uh, but the, um, in addition to, to the magnetic field, one of the key things that we can do with HMI is to look at the motion of the surface. The inside of the sun is filled up with sound waves. They're bouncing every which way. When they come up to the surface, they, they reflect back in. And when they reflect, the surface wiggles. And we can measure that motion. So we can, can make a map of motion of the whole surface of the sun. The next little movie piece shows the same region we were looking at, but it's showing a map of motion where light color is coming up and dark color is going down. You can see that it's just filled with these waves bouncing around. So almost all of that wiggling you see it looks like raindrops in a pond. It's these waves from inside the sun bouncing from the surface and reflecting back in. So what we can do is, is measure those and com do computations with them to deduce flows in the interior. So we can make maps of motions beneath the surface down from, ever, from 500 miles all the way down to the, to the, to the center of the sun. So it's, it's a, a great opportunity, and we're, we're really looking forward to having this kind of data that will allow us to really you know, study what's happening inside the sun as well as what's happening outside. Now for the, the sun as a star view, uh, go to Tom Woods. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm Tom Woods with the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I'm very excited to be here to tell you about the third STO instrument. We call it the okay. Extreme Ultraviolet Variability Ex Experiment, or EVE. Uh, EVE is different than these imagers. Uh, there, instead of measuring in images of the sun, we focus more on the spectrum of the sun, that is the different uh, wavelengths in the extreme ultraviolet. And I won't try to explain all the details of, of the spectrum, but I would like to emphasize we're measuring all the wavelengths of the spectrum, uh, including many of those that AIA uh, measures with their imagers. So if we go to the first movie. Uh, this is uh, a movie of the EVE spectrum. Uh, every peak, every emission line has a story to tell. And thanks to the new capability of EVE, we're ready to see hundreds of stories unfold during each solar storm. EVE measures the spectrum uh, with every 10 seconds, about the same amount of time you saw the, the spectrum scroll across the screen. In addition, we have detectors that can measure the sun uh, with a cadence of four samples per second. So why so often, and why, why is the solar EV spectrum important? So for the next graphics, we call this space weather. Uh, the sun is constantly changing, and solar events on the sun uh, can cause disturbance to Earth uh, that we call space weather. One type of a solar event is called a flare. Uh, and a flare, when it goes off on the sun, can increase the solar EV radiation by a factor of two to a hundred in just a matter of a minute. And just eight minutes after a flare goes off, it hits Earth's atmosphere with this full blast of energy. And these EV photons are so energetic, they break apart the molecules and atoms in the atmosphere, creating what we call the ionosphere. This is the plasma or charged particles in our atmosphere about 60 kilometers up. And when the ionosphere is disturbed, it can disrupt our technology, such as communication, GPS, navigation systems. And one example was that uh, there was loss of radio communication for the Katrina relief workers uh, a few days after uh, the hurricane hit New Orleans due to a solar storm. Uh, these new E measurements and SDO measurements will be used by NASA, NOAA, and the Air Force to more precisely predict each solar flare and how it will change our ionosphere. And with those modeling efforts to understand the ionosphere, they'll also be able to make better predictions of how it will disrupt communication and navigations. Uh, the more we know about these flares, the better we'll be able to be proactive instead of reactive 
to the impact of these solar storms on our technology. Prior to SDO launch, our flare monitoring was, uh, has been and will continue to be with the NOAA GO satellite using their solar X-ray measurements, but this is just two wavelengths. As you see in this figure, the GOES X-ray monitors a C4 type flare on March 27th. This is just hours after the EVE instrument opened its doors and obtained its first light. And I'm going to show you a movie of this flare uh, that EVE has observed, and it, you can tell it's much more significant than the GOES measurements because it's observing all EV wavelengths, not just two wavelengths that GOES measures. Uh, I'll illustrate some of the complexity of the solar flare event, uh, but let me explain the three panels you'll, you'll see in the movie. So for the next graphics, please. Uh, the solar image uh, is the X-ray image from EVE is on the left panel. Uh, the X-ray image is, only shows the active regions in the sun, so it's, it is somewhat challenging to visualize the solar disk, but you can see the active region when a flare goes off is dim active regions become very bright or flare up. The right top panel is part of the EV spectrum. As you watch the movie, you will notice that many of the hot iron lines will go up suddenly and then decay down slowly. And then finally, the bottom right panel shows the time series of three of the missions. So if you start the movie, please. Uh, an interesting aspect of watching this is that each mission has its own story to tell. Some wavelengths rise faster than others, they peak at different times, and they decay back down at different rates. This movie only highlights three emission lines uh, in the time series plot, but I remind you that EVE is measuring all the EV uh, wavelengths in the spectrum, more than 100 different emissions. Indeed, SDO is monitoring the heartbeat of the sun. Before I turn over to Lika for closing remarks, I'd also like to thank the EVE team for making this very successful instrument and providing many of the graphics that for the EVE uh, first light that you've seen, and also thank NASA for this very exciting uh, mission. So, Lika. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good afternoon. From everything that you have seen today, right now, it might seem to you that SDO's research is purely local finding out how the nearest star works and how it affects our life here on Earth. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. The universe is filled with electrically conducting material, gas, that ionizing gas that we call plasma. In some sense, the entire universe is filled with this magnetized plasma. Exceptions are um, planetary atmosphere. We reside in one or very thick interstellar uh, gas. We presume that most stars are also magnetically active like the sun, but the sun is the only star that we can directly access and study. If we can learn how magnetized plasma processes work on the sun, as we are attempting to with SDO, we'll know how they work in the distant corners of the universe as well. So SDO only seems local. In fact, I think it is going to provide us with the broadest, biggest signs. If I can have the first movie, please. Uh, what, what this movie is showing is in how many different ways SDO touches us. It evokes kind of a sense of wonder. And when we see these fantastic images, even hardcore solar physicists like myself and our panel members here are struck with awe, literally. It stokes our curiosity. You see these prominences erupting, the loops changing color, showing how heat is being transferred. You just want to know how these are created. How are they going to affect us? Are we going to be able to predict them? From these images, we can actually see new signs unfolding right in front of our eyes. And I think Dean mentioned something about that, theories being discarded. For the first time since the launch of Skylab, which is almost four decades ago, I think observations are ahead of theoretical models. I think Dick already mentioned that we live in the outer atmosphere of this restless, variable magnetic star, and that, that, that's really an important point. You know, while the sunlight enables and sustains life here, it also produces very harmful particles and radiation.